All right, good evening. I'm seeing Alex and Mario. We can begin when two other person joins us. All right. Any of you guys presenting on Wednesday? Good afternoon, sir. Good evening, sir. Okay. So we begin when uh, two or more persons join the class. Um, sir, I sent you an email this afternoon. My name is Alex Campbell. Um, I'm a new student. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So I'm seeing it. Okay, sir. All right. So the first thing I'll tell you, let me just share with you my email address so that yeah. you can... Uh, oh, so use my email address and find me on YouTube and you can subscribe and watch the recordings. So I post all the recordings and you can access all the recordings there from the first class up to uh, the last class as well as, let me just share this with you as well, Canvas, where's Canvas, here it is. So on Canvas, I have populated it with, why am I going here, with information, share screen, is this Canvas? Yes, that you can access for the various units. So let me go modules, so the home, when you go on Canvas for international business, you're going to see my image of me and a little bio. And then on the modules, you will okay. see information. So this is unit one. There's information about um, where did that come from? Let me just edit quickly. Introduction to international. I'm not sure where, where that word come from. International business. And under that, you're going to see the readings, when you go here, you can see these are the vid lectures and you'll see okay. readings here. And that's unit one. When you go back, the same thing for unit two, for unit three, and we are at unit four right now, which is international okay. trade theory. So you have the YouTube channel and plus you have Canvas to, to, to get information. And and the YouTube channel you say is your email address? Yeah, just type it into YouTube and you'll see, yeah, yeah and then sub subscribe and then you search for the lecture because there are other oh. lectures that are there because I teach other courses. The coursework okay. document, let me just respond. It means that I now need to add. So let me first share the coursework. No, let me stop share. For the coursework, no, 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 no. This is not what I want. For the coursework. Yeah. Um, let me, I'm going to go and find the document so that we can, I can bring it up to speed in terms of, because there are two things you're required to do for coursework. One is your tutorial presentation and two, all right, so this is the document. Let's bring it up. So actually, this, this, I think this is too big. Okay. All right. So everybody has been assigned a question already. What I'll ask you to do for me is you're going to have to do. For the same week. Yeah. In the same week. Um, what am I going to give you to do? Let me look at this. This is one. This is one international. I'm not giving you the same question. Oh, okay. Let me give you. Yes. Let me come up with a question.
What's your name again? Remind me of your name. Um, my name is Alex Yambo. Let's just tear this off. It's going to be I'm going to just send the document to you right now. All right. Um. All right, so let me just share screen and show you the so you're doing number seven and it is you're presenting in the week of August 16 to 20. You'll get a, by that time you'll get a, a um you'll understand what to do. Okay. All right. By that time you'll understand what to do in terms of presentation. I'm just waiting for another person or so to come to begin the lecture. Okay. To begin it with, um, just two persons, especially since you're new. All right, then, sir. Cool. All right, then, sir. Okay. All right, good evening, everybody. Hello. Afternoon. Good evening, sir. Sir. All right, so um, today we, we begin. Um, In our last class, we're looking at international organizations, the kind uh, and what led to some of um, 
positions relating to regionalism. We looked at um, the formation of CARICOM for the most part, or regional integration, as well as other regional um, multilateral agreements that exist across the world, such as the European Union. If you go onto Canvas as well, I've added a lot of information there for you to kind of go through and do um, some additional reading. I've also uploaded the lecture the recordings to the YouTube channel, so please pay attention um, or go and watch the recording. This week, in terms of the tutorial presentation, I'm seeing Jerome Parcel and Shanique Samuels. In the latter part of the class, I will um, speak to the whole notion of Turnitin and how to upload an assignment to Turnitin. So Miss Rachel Rose and Mr. Rossett can upload their assignment. So I'll speak to that in the latter part of the class. Today, we are going to look at international trade theories and how they help us understand international trade or what I want to call international relations as it relates to trade. So the first question I have is, what is a theory? And I'm listening. You can Google it, but I'm going to have questions. What is a theory? The first question. Yes, people, what is a theory? I'm listening. You can use Google to assist you in terms of responding. Yes, people, what's a theory? I'm, I'm not hearing any response. So speak aloud for me, Alex. So can you just um, read it? Mm -hmm. So a theory is a system of ideas intended to explain something, especially based on our general principles. All right, so in other words, what that means? So this is a system, a theory that system of ideas, like a brought up of like a brainstorm of ideas based on general principles that the person would think would be brainstorm, correct. Brainstorm, but brainstorm doesn't suggest system. Brainstorm meaning that ideas that are coming from all over the place. You know, like we say we have a brainstorm yeah. session, we just come up with different ideas, but it says a system of ideas. It means that the ideas would have been encoded in some way, shape or form, or would have, the ideas would have gone through a process for it to be included as a part of a system. Okay. Make sense? Yeah, I guess it makes sense. Yes. Anything else? Anybody else? What's a theory? Sorry, What's can a you theory? That, no, what, what, is, is, what is a theory? How would you define the, the, the concept, concept or the construct theory? You can Google if you want, but you know I'm going to ask it. Even if you Google, I'm going to ask you what it means. Uh, 
Hello. I am listening. Yes, so for Google it and tell her, and then ask what it means. But I'm going to ask you, even if you Google it, I'm going to still ask you what it means in your own words. Or you I'm must sorry. understand what it means. All right, so in my, in my own words, sir, mm -hmm. my own words, uh, my theory is like, um, so let's use a scientist, for example, like a scientist with a character experiments and based on that experiment, um, you will make documentation of each step and of each process. So therefore that will be the theory, I guess. No man, that's not a theory, man. That's just the, 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 the process of, of experimentation. That's the process of experimentation, but that's not theory in the truest sense of the word. Um, um, when, I, when I think more clear upon that, sir. Look at Google, what Google says. Uh, a simple meaning is a set of principles on which the practice of an activity is based. In other words, what that means? A set of principles on which the practice of an activity is based. Like I said, what I'm just a circle, basically that me read and put my own words say, a scientist with a character experiment and- Wait till you say it now, right? So you're going to repeat the error. Don't repeat the error. Yeah, so one, asking on my own words. Yeah, but if I tell you that is incorrect, you don't repeat the error. So one, you can say a theory is an assumption. So one is an assumption or a speculation about how life is or how life ought to be. And this is why the whole notion of descriptive and prescriptive. So this says, Alex, what Alex posted in the chat, he says, a system of ideas intended to explain something. So one, theories are there to explain. So theories are there to explain phenomena, which is plural, or phenomena, things that happen in life. So they might explain how energy is never destroyed but is transformed they might explain how countries behave when they when they are trading with each, with, with one another so they are really speculations or assumptions about life um, they either describe a phenomenon or prescribe in other words, they might say what should happen or what does happen. So the descriptive and the prescriptive component. Make sense, people? It's an assumption, it's a speculation. It's a kind so, of- so, um, yes. so it's, not, it's not something that is proven? No, theories are not necessarily things that are proven. They could usually come out of um experimentations but you see what you're thinking about when you say experimentation you think experimentation is just solely to the natural sciences but theories are not only to natural sciences what are, what are called social sciences give me a sec Yes. Um, so, right, I was saying that you can't think about theories as just being associated with natural sciences. In other words, experiments in labs. You have to think about the social sciences as well. For example, I'm, I'm not sure if you have ever done social studies when they're trying to explain how society works or how society functions and they introduce it to religion and education and things like that. There are, there are theories that are trying to explain how the family works or functions 
how religion works or functions, how the media does the same thing. So don't think about theory as just being something associated with the natural sciences, all right? You do have what are called social sciences. This is why you have people like a doctor. So not everybody here with a doctor is actually a medical doctor or is a, is a natural scientist. Some are what are called um, social scientists. They carry out experiments in education and things like that. So like Dr. Zaria Malcolm, who's a vice principal, she's not a medical doctor. Dr. Gudapati, she's not a medical doctor. There are several doctors and camp that have what are called PhDs or doctorates, but they are not medical professionals. All right, so so think about it that way. But um, it's a it's a nice way to begin, though, because um, usually when we thought when we think about theory and about and in trying to explain it, usually people usually go directly to the notion of natural sciences. So I'm going to I'm going to introduce you to play a recording that kind of introduces you to the concept of theory, and from there we will have a more fulsome understanding of theories. Uh, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Right, so my name is Alex Wiseman. Let me just bring it forward because we're not interested. And in Zapata Phelan article from 2007. Uh, it's something that I have assigned for one of the classes that I'm taking. Look for that uh, online textbook by theory. The information things happen is why things happen rather than just describe or predict. This why things happen is going to be very important. And if we want to, we can borrow a, uh, a definition from Bacharach in 1989, who says theories are explanations. So if you look at this, it says theories are explanations of a natural or social behavior. So it goes back to what I was saying. It's an explanation. It's a speculation. It's an assumption about a natural or social behavior event or phenomenon. All right. Some people are scientific theory. And when it says scientific, it doesn't mean that we're talking about chemistry and physics and biology. It means scientific in the sense that it's a systematic way. It's a system of constructs, concepts and propositions, relationship between these that collectively represent a logical systematic um, systematic and coherent explanation of a phenomenon. In other words, it's really a systematic way of explaining natural behavior or social behavior or event or phenomenon. And as this rightly says, theory should explain why things happen rather than just describe or predict them. So in other words, you do have theories that are descriptive or prescriptive, but you do have theories that seek to explain why things happen. All right, make sense okay. now in terms of theory? Yes, yes. I hope you guys are taking notes. Remember, I'm not going to tell you when to write anything. You know. At least you can watch the recording and then kind of take your notes. But I just want you to understand the concept of theory. All right. That is really an explanation of a natural in our sir, cases. Yes. Reading that, sir, the first line, it, to me, it also refers to the things you have proven and not just assumption. All right. So when I say assumption, so, all right, so these were things that were quote unquote proven at a given time. Mm -hmm. But remember, nothing is cast in stone, right? Time changes, generation changes, life changes, countries changes, behaviors change, right? So that's why it says it's an explanation. What happens in an experiment is that you either accept or reject the theory. Although in statistics, they really don't say that they reject, they really. So either you accept the hypothesis or you don't accept the hypothesis, which is a theoretical assumption about the behavior. There's either the social or natural behavior. Understand? So at, at some, so theories do come out of experiments, not, and these experiments are not just um, natural science experiments about how um, life, Either they're describing or prescribing or predicting life. But over time, people have to kind of prove them wrong or right. So this is why they become theory, because they actually form a foundation on which we can understand contemporary behavior. In our case, we can understand international trade and the international players involved in the trade and why some companies trade with others and why some countries behave the way they do. So that's what we're trying to do. We're, we are using these theories as a way to explain international trade 
or to predict international trade or to explain why international trade happens the way it does. Who are the key players? Why do we have, for example, multinational corporations or why do we have multinational, um, we have foreign direct investments? Why does um, China operate the way it does in terms of becoming a kind of manufacturing hub for the world? Does it have, does it have um, more, does it import more than it exports? Things like that. So that's what the fear is about, is helping us to understand contemporary phenomena or contemporary behavior or contemporary international trade and international relations. Make sense? Hello, make sense? Yes, sir. All right, uh, and that's it for, for this part. I don't need any, uh, um, any further for that. The other thing that I want you to, to, to be uh, mindful of are theories that are associated with international relations or theories of quote unquote globalization to some extent. And we're not going to look at all of them. We're going to look at the ones that are, or one that is specific um, to, to the course and that helps us to understand um, international trade and international business and how they operate. So I'm going to share screen. And I, I actually have mentioned this theory before. As be here. Over the next couple of number of so study of so-called main kind of missions. The question to start with is what makes mainstream theories mainstream? The simple answer is that these theories begin with an assumption of positivism. That is, they start with the assumption that the purpose of theory is, explain, is to explain how the world actually is. They do not make, or at least they proclaim not to make, normative prescriptions about how the world should be. These theories include liberalism, which is sometimes called idealism, as well as realism and its variants. We're going to look at these theories in a bit more detail in the next few videos. And after that, we'll look at the so-called critical theories of international relations. These theories move beyond mainstream theories in that they make explicit normative claims about how the world ought to be. They reject the notion that theory is merely descriptive, but instead argue that theory operates in the service of power. This emphasis was perhaps most clearly articulated by Robert Cox. Who All right, so there are two things, um, and I don't want to get too academic in terms of um, the class, but after World War II, I think I'd mentioned it this before that liberalism, neoliberalism, especially during the 1970s into the 1980s, became the the philosophy that was guiding international trade. It speaks to free market capitalism, limited government intervention, limited government. Um, government would play a limited role. The private sector would kind of monitor itself. It spoke about um, reducing quotas and, and trade tariffs and things like that. In other words, the world was supposed to open up to other players. And this kind of gave rise to um, a, 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 an Edward Siago. All right, the other theory that is mentioned here and that you don't need to necessarily write down anything about is post-colonialism. And I'm just telling you this for the purposes of you knowing that post-colonialism now looks at the world through a, an anti-colonial lens. It looks at the Caribbean as a colonial or a, as a colon, colonized space historically and contemporary, and how that has actually affected international trade and players and all of that. And there are many other things that are that are involved. So I, I just wanted you to understand um, international relations in that sense, because once businesses um, go outside of their national borders and they're selling goods and services, it is a part of international trade. And because of the importance of international trade after World War II, the theoretical, the theory guiding the, the world order at the time was neoliberalism. And I did not mention that it speaks to free market capitalism. And we're talking also about the notion of mass production, limited, um, greater access to markets and things like that. So 
there was a shift from a Michael Manne democratic socialism to an Edward Siaga free, free market capitalism. And I'm sure you always hear the contention in Jamaica about the PNP being a socialist party and the GLP being a capitalist party. It goes right back to the whole notion of these theoretical underpinnings that govern even local economic um, conversations. All right, making sense, guys? I hope I'm not getting too technical. Um, the other thing that I want you to also understand is the theory of liberalism. And I think I made mention of it before. And I want you to actually, you know, if you listen and make some jottings because liberalism is very important to us understanding international trade, globalization, and internationalization or the internationalization of businesses. All right. So I'm going to share a screen for you to listen. OK, so uh, they choose. That's what is anarchism is that conflict that occurs in the international system. And perhaps um, most importantly, the international uh, realism cannot explain the, the distribution of power in the international system is through war and the demise of the bipolar system. And for liberalism, the focus is on... Right, so it's a right, right, For liberalism, the focus is on enhancing global uh, political and economic cooperation. And so beyond just the state, other actors are IGOs, NGOs, and multinational corporations. So states aren't always seeking rational behavior so much as they are seeking compromise that occurs between various uh, interests within the states in order to provide cooperation across states. So the goals of states from a uh, liberal perspective is economic prosperity and stability. So economics plays a huge role in the liberal paradigm. Um, the key concepts, again, we can kind of think of as IGOs, international law, collective security, economic interdependence. Um, and so kind of think of anything that is cooperative, if you will, is, is pretty much something that would fall into the liberal uh, key concept bucket. Of course. Does that make sense to you guys in terms of what you're saying about liberalism and the conversations we have been having over the weeks relating to globalization and even regionalism? I, I just want to know that you're understanding and, and that this thing is not a little bit too technical. Can somebody respond, please? Hello? Sir, may I follow, sir? May I follow? All right, so tell us what you understand so far. All right, sir. So um, um what I'm getting, right, um, based on the different, um, well, based on, you know, the fact that we, we do have theories that can, that can basically explain um, the the workings of the whole international trade thing. Um, what I'm also getting is that we do have uh, what's the way I call it now? We do have um, uh, what's that word? I don't want to use the word theory. We do have some basic, some basic um, uh, sorry sir, man. Really kind of grab it. We do have some basic steps. I don't want to use the word steps, but we do have some basic steps that can are points that can really explain some of the theories, them like the neoliberalism. We are, you know, um basically what I'm getting as you've stated, it's more like a free market thing and how um different countries would actually um associate with each other under you know under that theory versus um you know we do have a more well this is basically i was i was actually reading a little bit also sir so mm -hmm. um so so, so I, I will say this that so remember the theory is helping you to describe what is happening the theory is not guiding what is happening but the theory is explaining what is happening yes sir um right. mm -hmm. so um basically what i'm getting is that the theories would fall into two major um well Basically, what I'm reading is that it falls into two major um, 
category. Um, you know, you have more of the, the free market, lazy fair kind of thing. And you also have um, a theory where, or some theories that actually fall under more government involvement. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Marxism. Whereas, You're talking Marxism. Yeah, Marxism, yes, sir. Um, so essentially, it does to some extent, right, based on the theory, you may find that, you know, we have like a, at a, like a number line, you know, you have the negative on the positive side. Um, you do have, it depends on, you know, each theory does have a certain leaning. So there's a certain level of involvement on some part where the government is concerned, while well, they have some that more lean to the, you know, the free market. But I don't think any of them, for me personally, I don't think any of them really is fully um, one or the other. It does have a, a level of involvement from both sides. So, so you know, this is just my understanding. No problems if it's, if it's your understanding. National law, collective security, economic interdependence. Um, and so kind of think of anything that is cooperative, if you will, is, is pretty much something that would fall into the liberal uh, key concept bucket. Of course, there are strengths to liberalism, helps explain cooperation in an international system, which would at first glance uh, suggest that cooperation isn't beneficial. Um, it also helps under, uh, to understand uh, the economic uh, economics of, of international relations. But some of the weaknesses is that they don't explain um, or have a hard time explaining some of the conflict that does occur in spite of cooperation. And many people argue that in the end, the weakness is that push comes to shove, states are going to fall back on national security as their number one concern. All right, but there's other theories. Constructivism. All right, so those I, I just wanted you to understand liberalism and how it as a theory helps us to understand globalization and um, the internationalization of markets and goods and services and even peoples and so forth the other thing that i want you to and this is where you're going to actually have to take notes because you're going to be divided into groups and you have to do a group activity is no what I call the evolution of trade theory. All right, you must take notes because you're going to be put in groups and you're going to have to actually explain the theories using specific examples. All right, so I'm going to share screen, looking at the evolution of international trade, beginning with it, oh, evolution of international trade theory or, or trade theory, beginning with mercantilism.
Can you name some of the trade theories that you were introduced to? So mercantilism. Mercantilism. And neo-mercantilism. I, I remember that I, from, from history in high school, so I do remember something like that uh, from the English. Um, you also have absolute advantage. Yes, I have absolute and, uh, advantage. Comparative advantage. Comparative advantage. New trade theory. Yes, new trade theory. Um, Porter's diamond theory. So Porter's cluster theory. Sir. Yes. Competitive advantage. Yes. Yeah. And Ricardo theory. All right. So what is going to happen? I'm going to give you about. 15 to 20 minutes or so and you're going to i'm going to put you in the breakout room and you're going to get a theory um, sir pardon me i've gone a bit low sir so, no, oh sorry no, i'm saying i'm going to put you in the breakout room now and each person um will get i'm going to pair you but um mario i'm going to pair you guys up um but one person will have to work on these are her own and you're going to present on the on the theory. Let me just put in the chat. So, what is the theory about? Is it descriptive or prescriptive? How does it explain international trade? strengths and weaknesses of the theory. All right. All right, so All right, so everybody's going to work as a peer now. So Alex and Ramon, you are going to work, kind of give us a sense of work mercantilism. And it's, it's, it's really the first theory of international trade. It goes all the way back to the days of, of colonization. So which one was that? Mercantilism. Okay. Yes. Um, for room two, Kayla and Shanique. Uh, let me switch something. Hold on. Let's switch something. I'm switching those persons. What did I do? All right, so in room two, you have Maria and Shanique. You are going to look at Smith's theory of absolute advantage. In room three, Rachel and Wayne, you're going to look at Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage. In room four, Christopher and Kayla, you're going to look at Porter's cluster theory. And in room five... Sorry, repeat, repeat. I'm going to repeat, just give me a sec. In room five, you're going to, um, Jerome and Maurice, you're going to look at international product life cycle. So let me go again. So room one, Alex and Ramon, 
you're going to look at mercantilism, room two, Smith's theory of absolute advantage, Mario and Shanique, room three, Rachel and Wayne, you're looking at Ric um, Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage, room four, you're looking at Porter's clusters, Porter's cluster theory, and room five, Jerome and Maurice, you're looking at international product life cycle. Everybody has that? Yes, sir. All right, so we are all, you're going to present at 8.20, the latest, 8.15, 8.20, the latest, all right? So we don't. So we in, we we want a presentation where we are seeing videos, but not just like a, a short video, not long video, where the video itself becomes a presentation. That's not what we mean. You might have a video, then you have some explanation, some kind of talking. If you can quickly put a little PowerPoint together or something, and kind of ex walk us through the theory and all that I've asked you to do in the chat. And especially, and examples are always good. All right, examples are always always good. I'm not sure what has happened to room three not seeing the persons who are in room three but um we will we will progress all right so i have opened the room i've opened the rooms so please just start working for me Maurice, why Maurice is not in any of the breakout rooms. He's supposed to be in room five.
Sorry, I'm going to throw the word down for more slide. No, 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 no.
Sir? Yes. Can you um help me get back to the room because my internet went out? Which room are you in? I'm with Mario. I'm not sure which room it is.
Alex, which room were you in? Room one, sir. Christopher, which room are you in? Christopher, <clears throat> are you hearing me? Yes, sir. Which room were you in? I believe four with Kayla. Okay.
All right. Um, let's go for the discussion now. So in room one, we have Alex and Ramon. Um, just talk to us now about mercantilism. Hello. Yes, we're hearing you. Hello. Hold on. Just right. one moment. Mercantilism um, is the world's oldest trade theory. So good evening, everybody. That's how you start your presentation. Good evening, everybody. My name is this. And we are in room one, and we'll be focusing on... Yeah. Go again, sir. Ramon. Give me a second, please. Okay. Um, Ramon and Alex, we're waiting on you. I gave you, I think I gave you more than enough time to kind of put something together. It's actually one of the shortest theory. All right, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll be presenting mercantilism. My name is Alex Gamble. I'm my next um, classmate, Ramon. Good afternoon, everyone. All right. So now we will be starting first with what the first question: What is mercantilism? Good night again, everyone. Um, merchant. We will be discussing mercantilism, which mercantilism, is um, mercantilism. mercantilism, um, which is the world's oldest trade theory. It became popular in the 1500s due to the 1800s. Um, mercantilism is an economic policy that is designed to maximize the export and minimize the imports of any economy. Um, <clears throat> this first popularized, popularized in Europe was based on the idea that a nation's wealth and power were best served by increasing exports. Um, countries that took part in mercantilism um, favored raw material, which would then be refined and resold to other nations. All right. Mr. Alex. All right. So mercantilism now on the whole theory is mercantilism was about the countries and their deciding on how they were about to trade. So what they what their theory was is that um, the more you export and the less you import would make a country more wealthier. So this was their idea of how going about it to make a country more wealthier in that um, specific time. All right, so we'll move on to question two, which was, what is the theory, the descriptive or descriptive theory? So this, yeah, the theory mercantilism, well, is, I'll call it, I'll give it a descriptive theory. Reason being, um, descriptive theories are mostly used to describe events that took place in the past and how those theories would go on in those times. So uh, back then in the 1500s to 1800s, uh, as Raman said, um, country would normally use this theory to make the country wealthier and more powerful in the Europe at the time. So descriptive theory, so it's explaining the things back at that time and showing how they, it could guide to the future as well as how it took place during that part of in the 18 on in the 16 to 1800s 
All right, so what we'll do is move on to question three. Come on. I'm here. My apologies. Um, question three, how does it describe international trade? I'm having a bit of difficulty with this one, to be honest with you. Do you have any info on this, Mr. Alex? All right, so when it comes down to explaining how international trade and it refers to the mercantilism, uh, they wanted to trade more and expand their trade they within who, the region. They who? Who, are, who makes up the day? The Euro the day. at the time. So those were the persons who created that theory at the time in between the 16 and 1800s. So that they were the ones that built theory. So Portugal, France, Spain. Um, Portugal, France, Spain. And a few others that were in that region at the time with that um, theory. They were so, not with the theory who was trading with whom. That's what you need to tell us. You said that the theory is describing an historical moment in the past. And I'm saying, who was trading with whom? You mentioned Europe. Oh, who was, who was trading with whom? Yes. Uh, and, uh, Europeans were trading back with the Americas. So what they did was, as well as, just like in history, it shows that they come to the Caribbean um, to gather wealth and all those, come back to Europe. So they, um, countries who had more resources would be able to sell their goods or uh, resources more expensive. So that would boost their, their trade. So now when they're, and that's why they cars, battles and so overall, just like in history, to get more um, resources. So the country who had the most resources will be more powerful, just like in as Mertican, uh, as the theory said, uh, they, they do it for the more resources. So, yeah, I get that why an international trade. Move on to question four. Strengths and weaknesses of the of the theory. It encourages the complete development of all natural resources for the country that is that is um taking part in this. It, this is a pros, by the way. It encourages trade deficit for foreign nations. Cultural exchanges are encouraged to promote trade. Um, one of the one of the drawbacks, of course. Can you explain any of those um, pros that you mentioned? Sure. Um, the trade deficit, countries that are because the idea is to export more than you import. So countries that are that are buying your goods would of course be at a deficit. How is that a pro then? For your country it is. For my country, For your, I, don't, I don't want any country. For the country that is taking part in mercantilism, and they'd be at an advantage because they'll be the ones reaping all the benefits of selling are exporting the finished goods. Continue. Um, many economists would have a lot of weight. Oh, by the way, can I move on from the pros and go to cons now? But okay. I said continue, sir. It creates a high level of resentment from other countries that take part. The tricking down economics, it just doesn't work well in real life. Thanks to the inherent greed that so many people have. Why give others money when you can keep it for yourself? The rich tend to get richer in a system of mercantilism and the, and the working class gets to be stagnant at best because they are constantly working for you. 
I don't get the sense you're talking about international trade. Someone says if you're talking about um, conditions in a specific country, but not international trade, which suggests one country trading with another. Okay. It creates, it creates a preference for the mother nation to always be first. Many colonies are also treated as foreign nations in a system of mercantilism. This means the colonies are forced to sell their local raw materials for a bargain basement price, and they'll be forced to purchase manufactured goods at a higher price than necessary. Because the country that does the manufacturing usually sells at a much higher price. And usually, as, as the nation is doing the importing, you really rarely have a, have a choice or an alternative but to purchase goods at a much higher or inflated price. And that's a con, of course, for those nations. There's a risk of raw material running out. And that is, that is we have seen that now. And, and in those days, you also had challenges with um, mining and so forth. The system tends to be quite inefficient. As material and, as material and goods are shipped back and forth between colonies and their mother nations, the price of goods is inflated more than it needs to be. Even with modern shipping methods, it costs less to manufacture goods locally where raw resources are available than it does to ship those items back and forth. And this creates vulnerabilities in both economies, which should those, should those shipments be inter intercepted by someone else. And in those days, you had, you had all kind of pirates and stuff that could cause have all kind of shipments. And that's the end of it. Alex, do you like to add anything to that? Um, no, not there's not much to add to it. Um, I think that's the end of our presentation. All right, thank you, um, gentlemen, um, for your presentation. It's very important um, that once you're when you're sourcing information, that you're able to explain the information. That's very critical. All right. So one of the things that I I, I thought I would have heard was the notion of colonization and enslavement because the theory speaks to part of what the Europeans did during that period of time. They were really um, hunters that went, that used the seas, found um, countries in Africa, Asia, and the Americas and really colonized them and extracted their raw material and use their raw material to make goods and services, which they would later export to other countries. Um, Sir, I, I did say that the international um, and the international. Trade. I never heard. I never heard slavery and enslaved. And, and, no, and not slavery, but um, them but that's came to the Americas and get the resources to come back. Yeah, but it needs to be properly sell. contextualized because it is part of it's part of what mercantilism is about. Is how America itself was oh, colonized. Yeah. It's part of that. That uh, color, and, and that and and remember, the theory is used to describe what was happening at the time. It's not that the persons who were trading were using the theory. The theory is describing, as was said. Um, I think by um, Alex. Yeah. It describes a moment in times of a moment in time of international trade. Okay. So there are some other things, but I'm going to I'm going to teach the the, the 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 topic itself in the following lecture. So there there are other things in it that it was really based on a um on a system of maximum export minimum. Or, 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 or minimum imports um, also to that it was about acquiring wealth through restrictive international trade policies. Um, government played a fundamental role because at the time 
the European international trade has really represented the monarch. And there are other things. So I, I will speak to that when I'm going to um, explore the topic. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, room two, Mario, I think you were working with somebody, but I'm not seeing, seeing the other person in the room. I'm just seeing your name, so I'm just calling your name. Yes, sir, I'm working with Shanique. Um, she's here, I think she's she was in and out because she's having some internet issues. Okay, all right, so Mario and Shanique, go ahead for me. Um, Shanique will get us started. If she is, well, I guess she is probably, I'm seeing Shanique. Shanique, are you able to speak? Probably still having some issues, sir. Um, all right. No, um, I can get her started if anything. Um, while she gets her things sorted. Oh, she's here. Okay, good. 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 She's sharing the screen, but is it that she? Um. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shanique, and we will be doing the absolute advantages theory. Okay, um, why though? A country that have an absolute advantage can produce a good at lower marginal cost. All right, hold on, hold on. Who's, where's the theory coming from? Who is the founding father? Oh, is that, is that yes. Idea? We need to get Oh, some sorry, content. I didn't see the top. Sorry, I'm so sorry about that. My laptop is moving slow. Oh, oh come on. All right. This story was brought about in, the ninth, in 1776 by Adam Smith and sought to have countries focusing, focus on production of goods and services that it is produced more efficiently than other countries. Country having absolute advantages would have free trade with each other, descriptive importing and exporting the goods produced bilateral. Why though? A country that have an absolute advantage can produce a good at lower marginal cost. With an absolute advantage, a country can sell the goods for less than the country that does not have the absolute advantage. Oh, the, cap the capability to produce more of a given product using less of the given resources than competing. The limitations. Trade is only between two countries only two commodities are trade. The only element of the only element of cost of production is labor. No transportation cost. So game may be may, sorry, so game may not be mutual and ben, mutual beneficial. It works under the assumption that exchange rates are fixed. And as, as, and as and sorry, an assumption of constant return as production scales. For example, um, excuse me, Mario. Mario. Yes, guys. Yes, I'm here. All which, right. Which one? The video must come in. Okay, no issues. Um, so guys, um, we had um a video to show, but um that would have been at the earlier part of the you know after the description. Um, no worries, no worries, Shadik. Um, so guys, as Shadik was reading just now, you know from our slides, we are presenting on the advantage, the absolute advantage rate theory, um, which basically suggests. Um, well, firstly, it came about as a result of um, the shortfalls of the mercantilism trade theory, as the group before us, you know, was presenting, uh, which sought to minimize um, some of the barriers that prevented free trade and um, 
the input or the high amount of input by the government in trades. Uh, so, you know, this sort of, you know, came about to, to really bring about a bit more freedom, you know, so nations could actually trade a bit freely with each other. Um, one of the one examples that we're looking at right now um, is Japan and Italy. They both produce cars or automobiles. However, Italy actually makes better quality um, sports cars. You know, your Lamborghini and your Maserati and those cars. Uh, while Japan actually makes better, you know, electric cars. You know, the smaller cars, like my little Toyota, right? So what, um, under the theory, what, you know, the, the ideal situation would be that Japan um, sticks to the smaller cars, the electric vehicles and so forth, seeing that it's, it's better able to produce them, while Italy focus more on the sports cars, seeing that, you know, they're able to more efficiently produce them. It wouldn't make any sense that, you know, you split your um, resources to try and manufacture boats when you can actually basically lead the market in the production of sports cars, the production of one or the other. Right, so um, if we move to the next example, um, Shani, can go to the next slide, please. Our second example really has to do with oil and uh, agriculture. You know, I'm aware, um, well, I'm sure you're aware of Saudi Arabia's capability, the production of oil. Um, we know they have a lot of millionaires and billionaires. They just went into their backyard and they drilled a hole and what do you know, there's oil. Right, so Saudi Arabia really has um, the handle where oil production is concerned. Whereas some other countries, you know, they would actually actually have to invest more time, labor, and effort into drilling and exploration, you know, um, to really get that oil out of the ground. So what, you know, under the absolute advantage trade theory, comparing the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, um, U.S. has a lot of rich farmland. You know, the U.S. actually grows a lot of wheat and corn, right? So, you know, utilizing this theory, um, it would be preferable for U.S. to stick to, or not necessarily stick, I don't want to say stick to because that would mean like one thing, but they would invest more heavily, right, in the agricultural sector to grow corn and actually wheat because Saudi Arabia would still need wheat and corn, right? And U.S. would still need oil. So if it is that you invest more, readily in the agricultural sector, if it is that you are the US, and for Saudi Arabia, seeing that it's so easy to get the oil, um, what would be better is that they would actually just focus on what they know best, and then they would trade, right? Um, we did see where there were a few drawbacks, right, where this is concerned, because normally it's limited to only two um, goods. I do believe that you can actually have an absolute advantage in different areas, right? So it's, um, I'm, I'm sorry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that you can actually have the absolute advantage in different areas and you can trade different goods. Um, however, at the end of the day, you may find that it's not very beneficial to both countries, you know? Um, exchange rate being one of them, you know, I mean, if we're to compare the Jamaican dollar and the U.S. dollar, you'll see... Well, you know, well one thing I'll say is that the absolute advantage really speaks to um, countries going the route of specialization. Mm -hmm. where, okay. where you specialize in what you can gain the most from in terms of international trade, as okay, opposed sir. to wanting to do everything. Sir, I, I don't necessarily mean everything, but could it not be that you... Um, have mo like maybe say two, you know. I'm thinking two things. You can do well in two in two areas, right? Um, so could it not mean then that you could divide your resources amongst both of them and still have an absolute advantage where trading is concerned? Of course, you can have an absolute advantage in different areas. So when it what they're saying, you know, they're just comparing two specific goods 
in this instance, so if you're talking okay. about the making of oil or whatever, then you're talking about you're going to have absolute advantage in other areas. So what theorists are saying is that, and I didn't hear Adam Smith being mentioned at any point in time. Sir, is, it was mentioned from the second slide, sir. I probably never, I never hear it still. So yes. what they're really speaking to is the notion of specialization and countries becoming um, kind of maximizing in areas that are more advantage to them as opposed to another country. Okay, sir. Yes. I just, yeah, okay, thanks for that, sir. I just wanted to really have your input on whether or not it could have more because I think it's, you can have, you know, more than one areas, but a lot of the reading that I was doing, I realized that they were making reference to only one area of production, sir. So um, just wanted to hear what you thought about that. Yeah, um, so um, Shani could have already gone through the advantages, right? We do know that it makes for freer trade, right? You don't necessarily have a lot of limitations because it's more of a bilateral agreement. So it's two countries just trading with each other. However, as I stated, one of the drawbacks, one of the main, well, for me, the, one, the main one that stands out is that um, the exchange rate may not be you know, unless the countries agree on a fixed exchange rate, which we know in, you know, in these times where international trade is concerned, it's, it's something very difficult to do unless both of the countries' economies are really on the same scale, on the same level, right? Um, for example, when I went to Panama, I realized that, you know, when, I, when I'm buying something and I get back my change, um, the Panamanian, and I don't know if it's dollar or whatever, but... I get mixed, I get the, the, the currencies mixed. So I, I get US and I get the Panamanian currency. And then when I made the checks, I realized that, oh, it's a one-to-one -one here in Panama. So I'm like, okay, good. You know, but if we're to compare the US dollar and Jamaica or the Panama, you know, currency and Jamaica, you would find that somebody is going to lose out, right? So unless both of the economies are really, you know, at the same level, you will find where somebody is going to lose and somebody is going to win. Um, the assumption of constant returns as production skills. Um, so just to give an example of this, um, with regards to calculations um, for this theory, you will find that, let's say, for example, we have two countries and one country will be like, okay, it takes, because the only factor this theory takes into account is labor. Right, so it will tell you that okay, it takes ten men to make one car, and so in essence, if you have twenty men, you should be able to make two cars, and thirty, you should be able to get three cars, right? But it doesn't take into account certain factors that may affect the production outside of labor. But, but, right. but think about it, though. There, there's another way for you can think about it. It's using the same car example. So in one mm -hmm. country, it might take, and I think Japan, I think you had mentioned Japan and another country. And Italy, where, sir. Right. So in one country, it takes, it might, let's say in Italy, it takes 10 men to make one car. But in Japan, it takes five men to make one car. Then, of course, Japan has the comparative advantage because they have mm -hmm. less labor for the same output. So, so the argument by the theorists is that, and this is a prescriptive theory, is that you should really, countries should really focus on areas where they have that competitive advantage. So because I know that I can make a better sports car, I'm going to focus on making sport, I'm going to specialize in manufacturing sports car as opposed to other types of cars that I don't have that kind of advantage. True, sir. Well, I think one of the one of the, the areas where that theory is really flawed, mm -hmm. right, is as I stated, the, the constant return as your as the production scales. So if it's scaled down by a certain factor, the expectation is that you'll get a certain amount of return. If it's scaled up, you'll also get a certain amount of return because the ratio, right, of input to output should remain constant, which we know is it's ideal on paper. Right, but it's not necessarily, you know, in the in real in the, um, real in the real world, you may not find where that is indeed the case. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, that's one of the major flaws that I realize um, 
you know, is um is one of the major flaws of this theory, as I was actually reading. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, I did mention the labor the the labor cost is the only thing that was um taken into account. Your transportation costs to move the goods, because I know some of us are studying supply chain management, so you know that you know you have to move your goods unless the person is gonna pay to come for them where you produce them and bring it back to their country, you are going to have to factor in other costs. And that wasn't taken into account. So at the end of the day, if it is that I want to train with somebody, depending on the distance, right? Depending on the resources available to um, the person I'm trading with and my resources, I may not be able to move all the goods that I want. So let's say I don't have these big jets my country is a very small developing nation i do have these big jets you know these military jets that the u.s send with them vaccine and all these things down here and mexico send because i saw that big jet landing out by airport you know i don't have anything like that to move all the goods that i want to produce you may find that my transportation costs will increase right as my production also increases so at the end of the day if i want to move my goods it will come at certain additional costs which may make it the trading not necessarily profitable for me, mm-hmm. right? Whereas the person I'm trading with could have it a little easier where transportation is concerned and other factors. So at the end of the day, they're, they're actually, you know, making more than I am out of that deal. So it's not necessarily a level situation unless uh, stated both of them are really at the same level. They have the same amount of resources available to them. It's more, sir, for me, this theory is more like something on, you know, it looks good on paper, but in application, in real world application, it's not necessarily ideal. Well, remember, you have to take the theory into, um, at the time it came um, came to the fore as well, in the late yeah. 1700s. So it yeah, was describing yeah. and prescribing um, what was happening at that time. And this is why I, I played the slide, the video that I showed, it says the evolution, because as time evolved, and international trade evolved and the players kept changing new players came on and new and other players came off and it moved from to some extent from just country to country to now um, multinational corporations to even individuals to country and stuff like that then other theories came to the fore and some of what you're talking about really comes under the comparative advantage which is what the other persons are to present on however time is out so we will continue our discussion on wednesday Thank you very much for um, the present. I think we had what, room one, two, and three. I just took a picture of the other rooms. So we will begin with them on Wednesday. They will begin their presentation. Let me just make note of that. Um, so that was ro- so room three, Wayne. I'm not sure who Wayne worked with. And room four, Christopher. And room five, Jerome. For the presentation on Wednesday, we have Jerome Parnell and Shanique Samuels. And the question is the examine. And everybody should come prepared to actually ask questions about number three for the coursework. Examine the role international bodies play in international trade. And for that question, you don't have to look at every single international body. You can look at, if you want to, because I pluralized the word, you can look at two or three, or if you want to even look at one. So you're looking at, so you don't necessarily have to look at every single international body. You can say for this paper, we're focusing, or for this presentation, we're focusing primarily on the World Trade Organization and the World Bank. And you're looking at how the, the role these two particular international body play in international trade. All right. So that's for Wednesday at, um, we know that we go, they begin at the last half hour of the class. All right. So have a good evening, everybody. Uh, I think it's we're up on the hour. Yes, it's a minute to the hour. I will see you on Wednesday. If anything, you can reach out to me via WhatsApp or email. Remember, I will upload the recordings by tomorrow to my YouTube channel as well as to Canvas. I try my best to, to upload it to Canvas. Remember that there is a lot of there. There are so many resources on Canvas for you to you can use to actually help you to further understand the topics. On Wednesday, I will show the persons, the, the, the two the previous presenters, that is Rachel and Ramon, um, how to upload their assignment to turn it in. Please ensure that before Wednesday, because 
um, I see a copy of your presentation so that I can actually give you some pointers if it is good or bad. And remember, any person who plagiarizes and it goes over the accepted limit, I will be either giving a zero or just 10 of the overall mark, all right? 10% of the overall grade. You will not plagiarize and pass. So you have to um, properly cite the information um, and, and do some amount of analysis. And this is why I'm here. If you're having a challenge, just reach out to me and say, sir, I want you to help me to structure my paper. I think there's something wrong with the paper. Just help me. All right, have a good evening, everybody. And I'll see you on Wednesday. All right, everybody. All right. All right. Thanks.